Okay, good afternoon, ladies. Ooh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Duncan Wilson. I'm based with the British Council in Bangkok, in East Asia, uh, the same part of the world as our illustrious speaker. Um, Kirk, Kirk Person, he lives in Bangkok for 28 years. I think he just said, so it's a long time Thai uh, aficionado, uh, like myself. Uh, he describes himself as a Thailand based linguist who has worked with the UNESCO Multilingual Education Group, the Royal Institute of Thailand's Nat National Language Policy Committee and with a number of NGO and university advisory bodies. Uh, Kirk's going to talk to us about recent MTB MLE, which is Mother Tongue-based Multilingual Education Projects and Policies in Southeast Asia, I think primarily in the Philippines, Cambodia, and Thailand, but also Vietnam, East Timor, and Myanmar. Uh, he's going to highlight how the cooperation between academics, communities, governments, and international organizations has enabled successful MTB MLE implementation. Without further ado, I welcome our speaker, Kirk Person. Well, thank you very much. It's always exciting to, be a, to speak at about, you know, later in the afternoon when everyone is feeling a little bit warm and, and your brain is overloaded with, with wonderful experiences. Um, so I will try to be a, a cheerleader today uh, because I am excited about MLE and I want you to be too. So let's Oops, I shouldn't start at the end. Um, so my, I basically have two aims today. Uh, first, to provide an overview of the multilingual education movement in Southeast Asia. And then secondarily, as was mentioned, to demonstrate the impact that cooperation between local, national, international participants um, is having on language and education policies in several uh, Asia-Pacific countries. Uh, much of this is very new news. In fact, one thing I'll share uh, just happened yesterday in Cambodia. So, so I'm trying to be uh, very up to the minute with this reporting today. Well, as we all know, our world is incredibly diverse, over 7,000 languages, and most of them are in Asia and the Pacific. Um, many of you are familiar with Jim Cummins. Uh, two years ago, he made this statement that I really love. When we look at the research that has been carried out in bilingual and multilingual education, what we see over the past 10 to 15 years is an accumulation of evidence that has become almost overwhelming, consistent across very different sociological and sociolinguistic contexts. So when we look at what we know and what should inform policymakers in the government, it is not possible to credibly deny the legitimacy of multilingual education for minority and marginalized group students. So again, he's focused, of course, he's been an expert in this for about 30 years or more, but again, he's saying the last 10 to 15 years, we're seeing a lot more evidence. Now, one thing we need to do very carefully is define this issue of bilingual or multilingual education. Um, actually, just yesterday, okay, the person is not here, a, a presentation used this term, multilingual education, totally incorrectly. So there are many people out there saying MLE, but meaning something different. So this is not learning a foreign language as a subject, like Chinese students learning English for one hour a day. That is not multilingual education. It's not teaching a minority language as a subject for a few hours a week. It's not translating some textbooks into the mother tongue and then say, okay, we have bilingual education. That was done in one area of China. No one used the books. They never tra trained the teachers to use it. But still, the claim was, we have multilingual education. And after a few years, they decided it did not work because they really didn't have it. Um, but it is using ethnic minority mother tongues as the main language of instruction for all subjects in the early grades and systematically bridging to other languages, national languages, international. So that's what we mean when we say mother tongue-based multilingual education. I'll use the term MLE through most of this presentation. So what we find in many communities, as I'm sure you've encountered, there are some children from minority groups who do okay in the second language. They can make the jump. Uh, but what we see worldwide is the majority of children are not able to transition well to the second language Many of them drop out. Um, in fact, uh, I can use the example of Thailand. Thailand is famous for 98% literacy nationwide. But if you look at the details among children, you find that, well, in Bangkok, the capital, about 1% are illiterate. And those are mostly children with learning disabilities. 
But if you get into minority areas, you find that 25 to 36 percent of children are still illiterate in grade two, which means they've been in Thai schools for four years, and they still cannot conduct basic uh, reading and writing skills. Um, and you find this in other places in the world. The World Bank has said that about half of the world's out-of-school children are from communities where the language is not used in school. And that's important because really only about 5% of the world speaks minority languages, yet 50% of the dropouts come from those groups. Um, also, uh, again, this, this research is a little old, but at least in 2007 they are saying many of the out-of-school girls belong to ethnic, religious, linguistic, racial, or other minorities. Uh, so in some cases this definitely uh, is a gender issue. So to address these issues, uh, back in around 2003-2004, several organizations based in Bangkok were noticing this pattern in, in many of the projects where they worked, that the children from um, minority languages were not doing well. So this group came together to form what is called the Multilingual Education Working Group. Uh, we are hosted by UNESCO Bangkok. Um, this, this was the original group. Now we've expanded. I think there are about uh, 10 organizations who are part of the, the working group. Um, our vision is basically quality education for all ethno-linguistic communities. Uh, we try to work with policymakers in various countries and assist the MLE movement any way we can with technical support, funding advice, uh, networking. I think one of our big jobs has been to try to get policymakers to meet with the local people who are actually doing this MLE work. Uh, that's a very challenge, big challenge. One of the main ways we have done this is through a series of conferences. And I think, how many of you have been to one of the MLE conferences? I know Carol has. And so, okay, a, a few of you here have been there and been speakers. Um, so by looking at these four conferences, we can trace the evolution of the MLE movement. Uh, the first conference in 2003 there wasn't much happening, at least in Southeast Asia. We had a few literacy programs, a few language revitalization programs, but not much MLE. So we had to look at examples from other places. And this is a favorite graph because it, it comes from my, uh, my home country, the United States. Now most people think that in the United States, everyone speaks English. That is not correct. Again, we have many thousands of children uh, Many of them are children of migrants who've come to the United States who do not speak English in their home. They speak uh, many Spanish, Russian, Vietnamese. Actually, in my hometown, uh, all of the things that are sent to parents from the school are translated into Spanish, Korean, Vietnamese, as well as English. This is in Texas, okay? So a few years ago, some researchers decided to look at these children and see which of these children are being successful in American schools because there are many different ways to try to help the kids. So they watched these kids all the way from the beginning of school to grade 12. Um, and in the early years, all of the different methods for teaching them seemed to be about the same. The children are making progress. However, by the end, we saw a great difference between those who were doing well, those who were doing poorly. Those who did poorly were the ones in English-only programs, submersion. Basically, the more time they had their mother tongue in school, the better the long-term uh, results that they had. Now, this is very political. Some American politicians disagree with this, but no one has really shown evidence to contradict this thus far. So at the 2003 conference, we looked at things like this. We also talked about how can you bridge between the first language and the second. And really, naturally, we learned to listen then speak, then read, and then write. So in an MLE program, you need to do those things first in the mother tongue, and then teach the children to listen to the second language, speak it, read it, and finally write it. Uh, now, of course, in most places, like when you learned English, what did you learn to do first? What did the, what's lesson number one for children in English class? Well, that should be. May, was it in your country? Okay, okay. Yes? Learning the alphabet, exactly. A, B, C, A, apple, right, A. So it's usually totally backwards of the natural way that we learn. Um, 
And that's true for uh, any, so really the ideal MLE bridge, as we've projected it, is starting in kindergarten or preschool, most of the, la most of the time in the classroom would be in the mother tongue. And then as the children get older, the mother tongue, this brown area, reduces. The national language, the blue area, increases. And then other languages, such as English, are added along the way. Um, and this type of bridging seems to be more effective. Some people have mentioned, like in Ethiopia, uh, eight years where the mother tongue is a good thing. The big danger is sometimes people see that mother tongue is working very well after just a year or two, and then they think it's not necessary anymore. So I think Carol and others have mentioned the uh, early, um, early withdrawal or trying to get kids, or early exit programs. In fact, just uh, two years ago in Cambodia, uh, a major political leader came to an area and saw the grade one children in the MLE schools were doing very wonderfully. So he said, this is great, MLE works, it's wonderful, and now we can cancel the project because the children are good at Khmer already. So we need that long-term approach. Also in that time, uh, Susan Malone, still in 2003, laid out what some of us call the spider web. For a successful program, you really need to do preliminary research on the situation, awareness raising, especially helping the parents understand, uh, develop an alphabet, an orthography. If it, the language has not been written, you need to learn how to write it. And again, some of us in here, well, Pakistan has developed five new alphabets in just a few years. Um, I've helped with three alphabets. Maybe some others of you have. So linguists can work with the community to develop new alphabets. It's, it's not impossible, like some politicians think. And then developing curriculum, reading materials, training the teachers, uh, monitoring and evaluating, making sure the teachers are doing it correctly, and also checking the progress of the students. Um, cooperating with other agencies and the government, and hopefully in the long term, a national language policy that will be supportive of MLE. So again, this is why a lot of cooperation is required for a strong MLE program. A one person, one organization will not be successful. Well, by the second conference in 2008, many, many people were starting MLE, and they brought all their posters, uh, curriculums, reading books, things that they had made, often that community people had made. And that's why, um, at the end, I'll be handing this out. This is a brochure on how communities can create curriculum. The curriculum does not need to be developed in the Ministry of Education in the capital city. Communities working with the uh, indicators and goals expected by the ministry can develop their own curriculum. They can develop songs to teach the children. They can develop games. They can use their local culture as a resource uh, for the education. Um, also at the 2008, we started to see some of the results coming in. For example, an MLE project in the Philippines showed that the children using their mother tongue did much better in English and much better in Filipino than other minority children who were in the normal schools. Um, by the 2010 conference, we endeavored to connect MLE to the Millennium Development Goals. Sort of like yesterday when we had the, the gentleman from Denmark talking about medicine and how language is a factor there. So we tried to look at health, um, other development topics, and link that to language. Um, and this is actually the Prime Minister of Thailand who had just signed a new national language policy that was supportive of MLE. So that was very exciting. And actually, all of these conferences, we've tried to have a special event for policymakers. Um, this time, we actually had a lunch for policymakers, a very closed, small group, and uh, most of them were silent the whole time. They did not want to commit. One man was actually trembling because he was afraid that UNESCO would force him to write a policy, and when he got home, he'd get in big trouble uh, in his ministry. So, so the policymakers were not excited yet. Um, but again, these pilot projects continued. One of the very significant ones has been in southern Thailand. Now, in southern Thailand, the majority are Patani Malay-speaking Muslims. 90% of the people, um, but they are under the control of the Thai Buddhist government. And since 2003, about, uh, 2004, 5,000 have been killed in this insurgency. 
Dozens of schools have been burned, and 175 teachers have been killed. Sometimes the teachers are in front of their classroom, and then surgeons come in and shoot them in front of the children. Now, why attack schools? Well, in the view of the insurgents, the schools are trying to change the children to become Thai Buddhists instead of Muslim Malay speakers. And so they see the schools as, a, as like imperial uh, places. Um, and actually, most of the children have been failing in these schools anyway. Uh, even one of the military generals admitted to me that one reason so many young men join the insurgents is they can't get a job anywhere else because even though they've been in Thai schools eight years, ten years, they still can't read and write Thai. Um, so f and the Muslims in the South had asked for bilingual education in 1946. The person who asked for bilingual education disappeared shortly after that, and it was 60 more years before the government finally allowed MLE uh, in this area. Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Thai levels in this area are very bad. Um, reading and writing abilities are much, uh, much lower than the rest of this, the country. Um, uh, so again, we followed this pattern of working with the communities to develop an orthography, using the Thai script to write their language, uh, write books, songs, games, all these other things. Um, uh, this is a, a teacher using a, a big book to teach some basic reading skills there. So a Thai person can read that book, but they would not understand it. Now, what are the results of this? Well, after three years in the program, they did tests on the students for four different subjects. The students in the blue schools were from the control group the schools where only Thai language was used. The students in the red group are the MLE schools. So again, this is the percentage of their exam scores. So we see that the majority of the blue students got 20 to 30 percent. So the majority in the normal Thai schools failed, and most of these were boys, whereas the majority in the MLE schools got between 80 and 90 percent. So as a parent, would you prefer your children to study in the blue school or the red school? <laughs> the red school. It becomes a, a very obvious. And now this, this was the students in grade one. Now they are in grade six, and the research results have just come in and shows that they are still above uh, the, the other children. Um, of special note, in the language, the Thai language, boys in the red schools did 126% better uh, in the Thai test, and girls 156% higher in math. So again, MLE helps language, like Thai language, but also math and science and other subjects. Um, sometimes the Thai language is used, like in a science lesson. For this, we use what's called the sandwich method. Uh, the a teacher introduces things in the mother tongue first and explains the key vocabulary. Then a Thai teacher teaches the lesson in Thai, and then the mother tongue teacher comes back and asks the students questions and clarifies problems. So it's not translating. If you just translate, the children go to sleep. Or they only listen to the things they understand. Their brains just turn off. So you need to plan very carefully what language is used when. Um, many of the mothers in the village come to spy on the children in their classroom. And they are very happy because they see the progress. Like this mother said, my first grader reads better than my older children. In some cases, the first graders go home and teach their brothers who are in sixth grade how to read. That's the huge difference that this is making. Um, and, oh, and not only that, I might say that in the 15 MLE schools, uh, no one's been killed. They haven't been burned down because the community appreciates it and they keep the, the insurgents away. So, so far. You know, every morning I see the paper and see another bombing in the south, and I think, oh, I hope it's not our school. And, and so, far, so far, it's okay. Um, so then, in 2013, we had another conference in Bangkok. Some of you are there. Uh, there is a big focus on language rights, language policy, how MLE can bring social harmony. Uh, um, and also, we celebrated some new policies in several countries of the area. And that's what I'll go into right now. The first was in Cambodia. Um, Cambodia had MLE pilot projects in five languages starting about 13 years ago. And so they followed this process where non-formal projects and then those non-formal projects eventually were included in government formal schools. And along the way, 
the government started making more supportive policies. An education law in 2007, guidelines for MLE in 2010, a bilingual education degree in 2013, and just uh, yesterday, <laughs> the new Multilingual Education National Action Plan that will continue to expand MLE from beyond five languages to other languages. And the Cambodians are so excited because they see that they are more advanced than their neighbors in Thailand about this. Because Cambodia and Thailand are always in you know, competition. So the Cambodians are, are happy to be the MLE leaders in Southeast Asia. The Philippines has been an incredible place for MLE activism. Again, looking at the past 10 to 15 years, we see MLE pilot projects in a number of schools, many run by NGOs. In 2009, the Department of Education issued an order uh, making mother tongue-based multilingual education really part of the, the education system. And then they had what we call a people power movement for MLE. Many different people and organizations got involved. University professors, uh, NGOs, language teachers, and even businessmen. Some businessmen who are frustrated by the low skills of their workers and they felt something different was needed for education. So in 2013, the Republic Act was passed, which essentially expands MLE from 19 languages to 50 languages. I'll admit that's a little frightening because it's becoming so big so quickly, um, but, uh, but it, it's, it's hopeful as well. All of my friends in the Philippines are very busy. In fact, there was supposed to be a Filipino speaker right after me. Uh, she could not come. I don't know, maybe she was too busy with, with this type of thing. So basically, MLE will be used nationwide, and English is being slightly de-emphasized. Philippines is famous for great English, but they're realizing they need a little less English and more of the mother tongue. Um, Thailand, again, similar process. The pilot projects in 2003, 2007, and then 13, a special policy for the South. In 2010, the new national language policy, which has been signed by two prime ministers, and currently the implementation plan for the national language policy is under development. We've had, a, we've had some coups, some political unrest in Thailand, so it's slowed it down a little bit. But uh, right now, um, MLE is happening in uh, nine different languages as of 2010. Um, uh, Myanmar. Now, Myanmar, of course, has had one of the world's longest lasting civil wars between the ethnic groups and the central government. Now they're trying to make peace, but one of the things that the ethnic groups want as part of the peace agreement is also to have their languages in the school. So UNICEF has started a project on this, trying to bring uh, language communities together with local policymakers to decide in their area, in their district, in their state, what should the education policy be? How can the languages be used? Um, and as a result of this, in 2014, there was a new national education law which was very supportive of MLE. Um, just a few months before that, the, in July, the law had been very uh, not ethnic language friendly, saying only Burmese and English in schools. So many organizations, UNICEF, Save the Children, as well as domestic NGOs started lobbying, and so they were able to change the law. But in the last few months, the government is starting to back away again and say, oh, we really don't need those, those languages after all. We'll see. You know, Burma had their election a few days ago, and the opposition party won. So now the big thing will be to see, will the new political powers support MLE or not? Um, one thing we hope will help this, uh, as was mentioned yesterday, in February, there will be an MLE conference in Myanmar. And it's to be international, so they would love to hear case studies from India, from Bangladesh, uh, from other countries here as well. Um, the, the deadline for abstracts is November 27th. Um, so if you're interested, you can look at this on the website and, and try to come. It should be very, very exciting. Um, also in China, you know, many people ask about the link between English and MLE. Um, uh, Anwei Feng has just concluded a large-scale research into minority groups in many different areas of China. And one of the conclusions is the children who have mother tongue do better in Mandarin Chinese and also better in English. 
So for, for his marketing in China, he's saying mother tongue is the best way to help with English because the government values English, of course. And this is going on in other countries as well. Vietnam, Cambodia, East Timor, um, Bangladesh, and of course here in India, where different types of MLE have been going on for many, many years. I, I think uh, MLE could become a great Indian export if you share your experiences with, with other countries in the, in the area. Um, as far as the MLE working group itself, we have a website um, based at UNESCO Bangkok, and I'd really encourage you to take a look at it. Um, if you are only able to do one thing, sign up for this newsletter. We have a newsletter, uh, I think it's quarterly, that is sent out right now to about 800, maybe 1,000 people. And that tries to bring MLE information from around the world. Um, so there are often articles from India or Pakistan of things that are happening. Um, we also have many different publications, probably about a dozen books about MLE. And some of these are in different languages. Uh, this brochure here, for example, is in English and Khmer. We really want more translations. I think there are some things that have been translated to Urdu and some in Malay and Indonesian. But so if you see a publication here and you like it and you want to translate it into your language, we're very, very happy uh, to help make that happen. So again, there's the website, UNESCO Bangkok Multilingual Education. Um, let's see. Um, also, as was mentioned yesterday, uh, our next conference will be in October. We're not sure of the exact dates yet, but it will be in Bangkok the third or fourth week. And there will be four main tracks. First of all, language and language education policy and planning. Again, trying to get more policymakers involved. Um, actually, with all this good news from Cambodia, Philippines, and Thailand, we are seeing more policymakers who are interested. So that's a good sign. The other big thing will be teacher training for MLE. Up till now, most of the projects have done in-service teacher training. Um, we need to talk more about how to get teacher training colleges to, use, to prepare people to do MLE. Um, it is encouraging what Carol was saying in, was it Madagascar? That they, that they have the, the teacher colleges had adopted some MLE? Or was that Ethiopia? Ethiopia, Ethiopia. okay. Okay. okay, so we need to reverse that. Yes. At least now one university in Thailand is offering an MLE specialization for teachers in the local area, and they actually got uh, 320,000 euros from the European Union to set up that program, because the European Union recognizes you know, that this is a necessary thing for peace building, for, for uh, academics. Um, also looking at MLE in early childhood, um, some of you might know that early childhood education is now a, a big, big uh, issue. It's very popular. Uh, last month, there was a huge uh, conference on early childhood in, in Beijing. So it's getting a lot of attention, a lot of funding. The problem is some governments then think, OK, we'll start the children at age three in the national language. Um, a Chinese delegate came to the conference in Beijing and said, we have wonderful bilingual education in China now for the minority children. Starting at age three, we teach them Mandarin, Chinese, and English. Wonderful bilingual education. And he said, 50% of parents support this. 50% support? What about the other 50%? But again, that's the problem. People think they're doing bilingual or multilingual education when really they're, they're killing the languages. Um, and also we'll be talking about the sustainable development goals. Uh, again, how can we keep language active in the sustainable development goals? Um, as one of the speakers mentioned yesterday, right now there is one statistical indicator for the first time in history talking about are the children learning in their mother tongue or not? Do, is that available? Um, I'm personally worried that some countries are going to try to get that deleted uh, from the indicator set. I won't mention the, the names of those countries, but uh, I, I have a friend who's from one of those countries. <laughs> so, so the MLE working group is trying to talk to the people gathering the statistics and say, you've got to keep this in. We need this information. Um, so again, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I, I've been talking very quickly. Uh, maybe you have some questions or comments to share. 
And oh, also I need to give out these uh, brochures or maybe... Questions or comments? Yes. Which book? Material development? The reading the book, um, the uh, NGOs or private sector or the school committee can develop cur uh, curriculum or textbook, something like that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. That that, that um, I, I do have an e-book that talks about. It's sort of like this small brochure, but much bigger. It explains step by step how to work with the community. Um, so, if you would like that, uh, give me your email address, and I will I will have that email okay. to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? And of course, I haven't talked about problems. There are many problems, but I'm trying to be a cheerleader. Yes. Thank you. Uh, as you know, in Pakistan, uh, we have uh, now going on um, six plus two, eight MLE programs. Hmm. And we are part of this group as well, the mm -hmm. UNESCO Bangkok MLE group. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, we are facing one single problem while we privately implementing these projects as the governments, you know, are not supportive of uh, MLE programs. But what we have noticed in Southeast Asia, they have their programs, MLE programs for at least six years, eight years, five years. But we have only these projects for two years, preschooling two years. And the big challenge is we face while graduating the students from our schools, they go to the other state-owned or private schools, the English medium, so-called English medium schools. So then the MLE, the, the mother tongue learning is stopped, instruction is stopped, and our, all our efforts maybe go futile uh, without any result. So I, I would uh, suggest uh, I would request you to discuss this issue with uh, the MLE UNESCO group uh, in Bangkok and other stakeholders. Uh, if we could be helped, supported to go with these projects up to a grade, grade fifth mm -hmm. uh, primary level. So that would be a, a my request to you to convey to them. Yes. I agree. I think that would be wonderful. Even with that, there, there have been some problems. Like in Pakistan, UNESCO Bangkok is technically over UNESCO in Pakistan, but for a long time, the UNESCO Pakistan refused uh, to do anything about it. So it's hard. But yeah. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Um, thank you for the um, report from so many places. Um, one of the recommendations I'm going to make to the organizers of the, this conference is to have a session of uh, influencing policy, of uh, experiences of influencing policy. Um, yesterday and today, I have met several young uh, participants in the conference who are despairing of the fact that uh, uh, nothing seems to be happening on the ground. Um, one of the things, one of the takeaways from this uh, presentation, for example, is that it takes at least a decade, if not more, for things to actually materialize in, mm -hmm. in policy. Mm -hmm. And it would be good to have a session uh, which actually has people who have worked for that decade, two decades, and speak of the, um, the, the rhythm of it, that it takes time to have these things come onto the ground. Right. So I, I think that's, a, um, that's something we need to uh, systematically give our younger colleagues, uh, younger participants in conferences like this, mm -hmm. to not give up, to not despair. Yes. I, I think, it, like I tried to illustrate, it started sometimes there would be special permission just for one or two schools, and then slowly it, it, it built up over time. And the other key thing is that people need to have a clear research results for every year, a standard way of testing the children to show are they really advancing. 
and also to compare with children in other schools. Um, it's been interesting in the southern Thailand, where we've had very good testing every year, now some people are saying, well, we look at the ch MLE kids in grade six now and compare to the other children who have been the control school, and we see now they're so low, and could we maybe do a special summertime program to help those kids uh, to come up to the level? So, yeah. Yes. Um, we haven't done a direct uh, comparison with that. It's all been comparing mm -hmm. Malay, Malay kids to other Malay kids. Oh, boy, I, I really can't say. It would be hard to, to say. Well, the way we can compare, um, in grade six, they have the national test. So in a few months, all the students in the country will do that. So we'll be able to see, see where they stand. I just have a question. I mean, um, I don't have a lot of experience in Emily, so mm -hmm. I don't know how, what you think of this question. There are states in India where, mm -hmm. although the language is local, the script is English. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you talk about uh, communities building the curriculum, mm -hmm. um, I've met people there and uh, they're not very, they haven't been to schools, mm -hmm. um, they don't have access to electricity, let alone internet or anything else. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine they're pretty, uh, they're still not so-called developed, mm -hmm. even in terms of you know, Indian cities or comparably. Mm -hmm. So do you think they can develop their own curriculum even then? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I mm -hmm. really don't know, and so I'm asking. Yes. They, they would need lots of help from outsiders to encourage them and show them how to do it. But I think if a few key people in the community get excited with the idea, they can start you know, producing things. Often we'll have a workshop um, with a different topic. Maybe the workshop is writing folk tales. And the first few days, everyone is very scared and they're very hesitant. But then over time, as they develop confidence, suddenly at the end of the week, you have 20 or 30 small books that have been written. And it's really a process of empowerment because so many of these minority communities believe that they can do nothing because that's what the, the bigger society tells them. But as you walk alongside them, help them see the value in their culture and the ways they can use that to help the children, it's often very, very encouraging and... Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but it takes a lot of patience in the beginning and it's working. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kurt. <laughs> a, a token of appreciation from the uh, oh. uh, photo of you in okay. the All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>